Hoffman, and welcome to this episode of Data Exposed Live. We are super excited to have you joining us here once again on this Wednesday, uh, where we're going to be continuing our Azure SQL Virtual Machine Reimagined series. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on our guests. Um, our first guest is uh, David Pless, who's been on the show a few times now. Um, David, thanks so Hello. much for joining us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Well, let's see. I, I I cover Azure SQL Virtual Machines, sizing and storage. Um, the storage engine is a new area I'm focusing on, and uh, performance in uh, tuning and optimization. Awesome, cool. Uh, and we also have uh, Pam joining us today. Uh, hey, Pam, uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure, uh, I'm the lead PM for SQL Server and Azure VM. Um, and I work with David and a few other PMs on just kind of maximizing um, everyone's experience uh, when running SQL in Azure VMs. Awesome, cool. So it seems like we have the two SMEs that are really going to be able to help give us kind of an inside look at getting the most out of your VMs. Um, so I think it's going to be a really good episode. And the topic for today is measuring performance and monitoring health. Now, I did mention that this was part of a kind of ongoing series that right. we're doing uh, with the VM mm -hmm. folks. So Pam, can you tell us a little bit about like, if people haven't watched the series, what happened in the previous episode and what we're gonna talk about today? Sure, absolutely. So one of the most common challenges we see in Azure VM is customers that move from on-prem have some trouble um, sometimes choosing the right VM, choosing the right size, setting up storage, and just making sure that the VM is configured in a way that will um, you know, set them up for success and make sure that they get the best uh, performance and the best price performance ratio. And and so we've had a couple of different series. We had the um, just kind of the overview on the experience of running SQL Server and Azure VM. And then we did one on um, sizing and how to choose the right VM for your workload. Right. And uh, we also did a deep dive on storage and talked a little bit more mm -hmm. about how storage works, especially um, the thing with storage is it's so much different than what you do on-prem. Um, so those are the first three that we did. And then today, David will talk more about uh, monitoring for sizing. Again, we're kind of going with that same theme of, of how do you get the, the biggest bang for your buck uh, running SQL and Azure VM. Cool, I think that's something that like a lot of people want to know how to do for yeah. obvious reasons. <laughs> right. um, but when we talk about monitoring, to kind of get into what we're gonna be talking about today, like what are we monitoring and why are we monitoring? Yeah, that's that's a it's a good segue to, to the uh, core topic. And, and when we get into the performance insights we have a demo and performance insights we're also going to be uh like uncovering some of the storage topics as well i just want to say that really quick since we're on the topic um so on the question of what are what are we want what are we monitoring and why are we monitoring we will uh we'll be monitoring metrics and performance at the core resource levels like cpu memory and definitely storage because we want to size for storage this is going to be from our source platform, but also taking that same monitoring and following our deployment to Azure and monitoring there as well. And the only thing that will really change in some regards is the methods we use to monitor. The, the reason we monitor the source is that we first need to find a size that meets our needs. And, and a large part of this is like total cost of ownership and being able to, to make sure we are within budgets, but also to make sure that we don't need to resize and that requires that we continue to monitor. And so a lot of like our ability in the cloud is to be able to have the deployment that we need that meets meets the performance at the performance levels that we have, but also be able to resize those scenarios and make sure that they're in line with our workloads. So the first and most important step for migrations is monitoring that source performance. And the other aspect is monitoring where we land. And we have to do both um, uh, what we do on-prem for sizing, and that's going to carry over to monitoring how we're sized in, in Azure. OK. So and again, kind of going in along with our sizing methodology. OK, so when you size your application. We covered a lot of this in the other session, so I'm going to just touch on this here. But we really need to think about what we purchased um, and, and sized on-prem and why, and this really comes down to the CapEx versus OpEx scenarios. 
And because we are in a scenario where we have so much hardware, more hardware than we than than we may necessarily need, we're we're sizing for those three to five year cycles where where hardware depreciates. What we often want to have is a scenario where we're using our budgets before we lose our budgets. We hear we hear that all the time. Additionally, we often pull our budgets for larger, richer strategic purchases on prem, like replacing a SAN. So we often lean towards these five-year budget cycles. And basically, because we purchase in this way, we're purchasing for longer cycles. This can be, uh, it, it's sort of a, a challenge when we're comparing what we're doing on-prem to the cloud, because we certainly don't want to go in and find a host that is sized in the same way that we have on-prem, right? So like, you know, when, when you're looking at your page life expectancy counters or your available uh, what's available to to the machine? We're not we're not trying to achieve the highest score like you would get in an arcade game. You're you're trying to really you find find a a, a set of resources, whether it be memory, CPU, um, that meets the the workload as much as possible. That can also handle those spikes when those spikes occur. And this is why we want to size and monitor, and then continue to monitor in the same way that we found from our source platform. Anything to add on that, Pam? Um, anything that, I'm, I know I'm touching on this and we've covered this before. Yeah, no, I, no, I think that was good. I mean, the main thing, the main point you made was the one that I was you know, gonna make that you, you don't necessarily, you, you oversize your hardware on-prem, you don't wanna mm. oversize your hardware in Azure because you're renting right. it effectively. Right, and so right. you don't want to pay now for hardware you need five years from now. You want to pay now for what you need now. In five years, you can you can resize. That's the benefit you get in Azure is you can resize as you go. When the CPU starts running hotter and hotter and hotter, you can size up. So right. it, it's best to not necessarily look at what you have on-prem for hardware, but look at what your workload is using. And, and that's what this is uh, this presentation is all about is how do you figure out what that workload is using? Yeah, I, I describe it as fly, you know flying close to the sun, and, and I mean that in terms yeah. of not not having too much you know space that you're giving, uh, you know resources that you're you know that you're not paying for. So you want to make sure that yeah. that you're doing that. So we've covered this um, before. I'm definitely going to just lightly touch on this. Um, we, we definitely want to use our memory optimized series compared compared to. Um, uh, the general purpose and confidential computing and storage optimized. Those are the the three series that we really pay attention to. But we want to target our M series, the EDS V4 and the DS V2 1115. Notice I'm kind of starring on the EDS V4. Memory optimized is going to be best for your enterprise scenarios. Your general purpose and confidential computing, that's going to be your, um, let's say, departmental workloads. And storage optimized is going to be for your big data, ETL, data warehousing. And what's unique about that is it has an extremely, um, uh, e extremely powerful ephemeral uh, disk scenario where you can get extremely strong I/O and throughput uh, capabilities. However, it is ephemeral. So if you if you were to deallocate those core drives, uh, uh, you would lose the data on that on those drives. So it would need to be a scenario where you can recover the data from a source platform, um, such as a, another RDBMS or potentially like an Azure data lake. And these are the, the machines that I'm gonna break down from, from a memory optimized perspective. And again, uh, tagging the EDS v4. So the, the, this, these are the memory optimized series. So, so these are the ones we want to definitely target, but you have that, you know, um, consistent uh, memory ratio of, of for every uh, core. We have set, set, uh, seven gigs of RAM across the virtual machine. All of these machines are going to support uh, premium storage and premium storage caching. The EDS V4, we, we really like this, this series a lot. Um, it has a very consistent mem to core ratio. It, it really comes, there's a couple of things that I like about it. One is that scalability across the table. So if you're trying to scale up and down, it meets it meets your needs quite well. Um, 
The other scenario is, is the IOPS and throughput at the storage level is really, really strong. The M series, if you need the, basically I'll, I'll say it this way, if you need the memory, if you need the memory, look at your M series, and this is gonna be more of your mission critical and data warehouse scenarios. Now that that's, uh, the, like in summary, like if you want to, if you want deeper information on sizing, please see the previous data exposed on sizing. Um, Pam, anything to add to this? Because I'm um, going pretty only, quick on this. Yeah, no, only one more point I wanted to add, and that's um, sure. if you're very price conscious, um, we find that that EDS v4 series is the best price performance oh, yeah. ratio for SQL Server workloads. Um, so not only is it yeah, great like for well the scaling. Priced. Yeah, exactly. It's priced so much lower than the M series because it doesn't have quite as much memory as the M series, but for most SQL Server workloads, it has what you need. We find that that one to eight mm -hmm. ratio is kind of the sweet spot for most SQL Server workloads. So unless you're talking about a data warehouse or a really, really, really high end OLTP system, that EDS v4 series is probably the right one to go. And it's the one I would start with, I think, if you're not sure where to go in Azure, that's the one I would start looking yeah. at. No, that's definitely really helpful, especially because like you guys already kind of narrowed down. There's a gazillion different options. Um, so you guys have done a great job narrowing down. And then if you're still like, I'm not really sure, then you kind of uh, led us to the right direction, at least where to start. I know there are other considerations around like your data, your log, your TimTB. Um, right. You know, it would be great if you guys could dive into like how we think about making decisions there. Yeah, we've, we have, I have a, a that's kind of the next step is to kind of break down our storage uh, sizing decision tree. But what did we have before? Was it like 380 some odd VMs that we broke down in three, the sizing? Three, 375, I think there's 370. Something, something like that. Something that, like yeah. that. there's 375 <laughs> different VMs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, so if, if, if for those that are interested in how we broke those down, see the sizing, <laughs> VM sizing session. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the like storage sizing decision tree. Um, these data points for data file, log, and TempDB, we leverage this for both our, our tooling scenario as well as how we're taking the approach of getting the storage identified. So, so let's talk about uh, the data file first. So we're going to walk through the methodologies of sizing for our data files, um, and this is the MDF files. So really, it comes down to if you're doing a current migration or not. If the answer is yes, um, then what is the size of the data files? So we, we size based on capacity, IOPS, and throughput. This is the way Azure Managed Disks are offered. So, and, and you can think of these as the knobs that, we can, that are used to select disks, where any of these scenarios can push us into the next tier. If the answer is no, I'm going to tell you to follow the documented approach for um, uh, SQL Server best practices. We've we've overhauled the documentation there. Uh, steer towards that, and then also take the recommendations from your vendor. I'm hope hopefully your vendor has the IOPS and throughput and capacity needs based on you know the number of users you have. The, every app is going to differ, but take those recommendations and apply those. If you know, from a high level, we, we recommend starting with your P30, P40s, aim for capacity, and then leverage our memory optimized virtual machines. The next step is going to uh, be applying your IOPS and throughput. If you've already have the IOPS and throughput captured, then you can match those capacity needs, the number of disks for your minimum VM option on the table and your IOP and throughput needs to a combination of, again, those P30 and P40 disks in a storage pool. Uh, the, the storage configuration template makes this very easy to achieve for our marketplace image. It, we Actually, we covered this topic, Pam. I think we covered this one in the storage, in, in the storage deep dive that we did. Yeah, we did in the storage deep dive, yep. Yeah. Now, if you don't have the IOPS and throughput, then you're going to need to obtain this information. And this is a little bit of what we're talking about here in this series is uh, is is getting this information. Uh, the best bet still is leveraging your performance counters, and and it is recommended to to leverage a tool or process that can capture for identified workloads like nine to five nightly ETL report hydration activities, end of week processing. And um, PSS Diag, Perf Insights, Perfmon, they're all good methods to obtain these counters. Really, I, I don't so much care that 
what tool that you use as long as it's lightweight and that you're getting the identified workloads, okay? Now, once you get your performance counter data, this is gonna map you back to matching your IAP and throughput needs to the P30 and P40 disks in the storage pool. For your data files, this is gonna be with read-only caching. And we always recommend uh, targeting the uncached IOPS and throughput in your VM and in your Azure disk documentation. This is where the cached IOPS and throughput can be seen as a safety net to handle any kind of bursting so you can weather any, any busy periods. This will help prevent you from having to constantly resize to address those busy periods. Um, you need to understand the customer workloads. And again, know the workloads and apply counters to Azure disk and throughput recommendations. And we make this easier in our tools. And we'll be covering these, uh, covering these soon. So again, you know, you're taking these scenarios and, and, and through the storage configuration tool, we're going to get you into a storage pool and we're going to have that read-only caching enabled. And actually, when we look at Perf Insights, you'll be able to see where, where our storage pool alignment and some of, the, um, some of the storage best practices are applied. Now, this is data files. Now, for your log file, your transaction log file, that is, this will have the same performance counter scenarios, but how the recommendations are applied are going to be different. Again, it does come down to whether you're doing a current migration. If the answer is yes, then does your workload require single digit latencies for the transaction log? Most production environments do not have this requirement, but those that do, <coughs> excuse me, such as like high end, uh, public facing OLTP environments like ticketing, gaming, mainstream retail systems, they have um, unpredictable large traffic patterns and, and there can be storage configurations or considerations that is that, that need to be employed to address that. Something, something, to be, uh, something to be aware of. If you do require single digit latencies, then you, then you have the, um, you have a couple of options here. Um, you could um, you could use the right accelerator if you're using an, an M series, or you could use Ultradisk. Now, again, I for I I don't see most customers having this situation, but when you need it, you need it, and you know that you need the, that low latency scenario. So, um, if you're using Ultradisk. Um, Ultradisk, this is like a, a single large disk that's going to meet your space needs. It has separate knobs for IOP throughput and capacity. It's a little different than your premium disk. You don't need to have multiple disks, um, and often you don't want to have multiple disks because you're trying to lower your disk count to stay on the table. Um, so if, if you have too many too many disks, it could, it could force you into a larger VM than you other, otherwise would be targeting. Something to keep in mind. Um, the right accelerator is only for the M series. So if you're on the M series, recommend using the right accelerator if you need single digit latencies, otherwise use Ultradisk. And then this is gonna push you into, again, the storage pool. Um, because we don't need uh, caching for, uh, for your log files, you can go from a P30 all the way up to a P80. And again, why would you have larger capacity scenarios and go into a larger drive? It would be to reduce the, the drive count. Um, and you would use um, either Ultradisk or write acceleration if you need that single digit latencies for the log file. Now, um, what quick do that question, David? Um, I was just curious, like for the M series, why isn't there kind of like a branch that lands you into a storage pool? <clears throat> oh, that. That, that would be the same, it would be the same for the M series as well. The right acceleration is not a, I'm glad you brought that up. It's not a disc technology. Right acceleration mm -hmm. is a technology that is specifically for the the virtual machine type and it's only for the M series. Got so, it. You, so you're not gonna go find a right accelerator disc. It's, a, it's something that is tied to the capabilities of the virtual machine. Uh, Pam, anything you would want to add on here before I move to to maybe, or do you think? I'll no, no. I, yeah, no. I think I think you covered everything. There's just um, I, I, just one thing I want to note on the latency. Actually, um, I just remembered that um, you know 
the latency for storage is is definitely going to be higher in in Azure than mm -hmm. it is on prem. It's just the nature of using remote storage. Um, so I would say True. don't fix. Yeah. So try not to fixate too much on, I need to match the latency I have on prem because again, the hardware you have on prem is probably like, like, you know, super fast and, and a lot bigger than you need and all of that. And so you're probably not going to see the same latency. You'll see a little bit higher latency in Azure. However, that's not necessarily going to impact the performance of your application. So we've had mm -hmm. some customers where they're like, oh, our latency is so much higher here. We're doing all these, uh, you know, they're using like IO uh, tools to test. They're not using SQL Server. They're just using these IO tools. And they're saying, right. oh, well, the latency is so much higher. But then when they go and actually test their application, they're like, oh, but we're not actually seeing any problem with the application. It's like, yeah, sometimes that disk latency isn't really a big deal because of the caching available in SQL Server, because of the caching available, you know, if you're leveraging read caching and all of that, um, even caching in your application, that latency is a lot of times buffered. So try not to fixate yep. too much on the numbers, to fixate more on your performance numbers from the application. Make sure you have good load tests in place and that you're measuring that latency. And don't worry so much about the... Um, you know, the direct latency to the storage. Right. And then and also think about application latency overall. You would you can address yep. that in different ways in the cloud as well. Right. Right. It's, it's more than just storage latency. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So um last and certainly not least is Temp DB. Temp DB is six equals six, right? So that's kind of one <laughs> of our, our credos. <clears throat> so for, for Temp DB, it really comes down to size. And, and it all depends if TempDB can fit on the ephemeral disk, because we're going to tell you, we've done plenty of testing on this. We want you to target the ephemeral disk um, for TempDB. We always recommend getting TempDB placed on that ephemeral disk if possible. The only reason you might want to consider uh, placing TempDB on remote storage along with the data files is if, you're, if your virtual machine does not have the capacity to store it on the ephemeral disk, and then it's counterproductive to increase the size of the VM just to get to a larger, a larger uh, ephemeral disk. And so there's a, a number of ways that you can that you can track that. I really like using the Management Studio report disk usage, um, and just know that um, you know you're what you typically see from TempDB. You're just going to go right back to that size after a recycle. So this is something that you should you should be monitoring and looking at the the health over time or the size over time. Um, so otherwise, uh, there's a couple of options that you can that you can choose. Like first, if we want, if, if the best scenario is if we can choose a VM that has enough space to target uh, uh, TempDB on that ephemeral disk. If not, you're going to place TempDB on Azure Premium SSDs. That's your P30 and P40. Um, and there's possibility, and, and I, I'm I have this for completeness. This is not necessarily what you would. What you would see in in most environments, but like if you're a hosting company, and there's there's uh, let's say a, a database for every user, and you're and you're using virtual machine, the LSV2 series may make sense because of the large ephemeral capabilities that it has. <coughs> Just be aware that these uh, this VM series does not support premium disk caching. Okay. So let's talk about. Um, oh, I should really change. Is there any any other things that we want to add here, or should I continue? Now I would I, I would go forward just, just to okay. say that the, the TempTB configuration is the same in VM as it is on prem. The difference is just where do you put it, and the T right. drive is perfect. So and it's okay. you know it's it's there and it's free. It doesn't hit yeah. your your remote cat your remote IOPS. So that's the key point. That's the point I didn't <laughs> mention is it's not going to count yeah. against your uncached IOPS, which right. is really exactly. important. Yeah, yeah, so it saves that bandwidth for your data files where it's important. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about metrics for performance, uh, performance monitor and methods to capture. Um, I'm just going to touch on this lightly because we have co covered this before. Mm -hmm. Just, just, just note that you know IOPS are the number of requests that your application is sending to storage in a second, and you're going to map this to disk reads per second, disk writes per second in perfmon. We do have a slide that covers the counters, so. That's like, you know, that that camera slot type of slide. So not to worry about that. Throughput is the amount of data um, read from or written to per second. This is actually the data that we're moving. And you can map, map this to disk uh, read bytes per second, disk write bytes per second. 
And the IO size, you know, SQL Server is going to control going to control the IO size. It is something that you can monitor, though. You can monitor this for the average disk bytes uh, uh, read and average disk bytes per write in perf month. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can also uh, uh, get the latency in the average disk sec per read and average disk sec per write. Um, and monitor monitor that, but th it's really important to monitor both. I guess really the key thing here is monitor both the IOPS and throughput. And fortunately, in uh, perf diag uh, uh, diagnostics that we're going to take a look at, we map this to your Azure Disk scenario as well. So we'll take a look at that example. So for your key counters, and um, I'm going to go back to the point that uh, that I'm uh, I mentioned before is you're, you're monitoring for your workload. We're really kind of looking at the work set and in, in what SQL Server is, the space it's consuming. I'm not worried about taking what you have on-prem and dragging that into the cloud. That's counterproductive. What I want to do is find the best possible space, whether it's platform as a service, whether it's a virtual machine, and be as close to that to, to that um, resource configuration as possible. That way, you get the you get the best value. And the method, and, and seriously, Pam, I, there's hundreds of counters, right? I mean, I, oh, I, yeah. I care about this about, and 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 even this, I'm going a little far, right? There's about <laughs> yeah. so it's about 20, 20 counters that you really care about. If you get this, this is all you need. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So, and uh, one thing, actually, David, can you? Uh, one thing I wanted to mention too is, go um, back. yeah, I, you, don't, you don't have to go back, but I mean, the the other thing too is to measure if you can measure um, data files, tempdb files, and log files separately. So if they're on separate drives, oh, make yeah. sure you monitor them separately because they're going to be targeted three different w places and they're going to be um, mm -hmm. sized three different ways. So you, you're going to size differently for tempdb versus data files versus log files. So it's important that you measure them separately so you know the read throughput and the write throughput for each type of file so that you can size each area appropriately. So so don't just dump everything all together and measure one um, right. number for SQL. Make sure it's separated. If yeah, good call. So how do we get how do we get this data? Um, many of you may have had a CSS engineer run run PSS Diag in your environment. It's really the see It's just a, a different template for SQL Diag, and that's public publicly available. That'll grab grab your perfmon counters for you. You can use SQL Nexus to analyze this output. You can go in and, and create in uh, on Windows. The setup perfmon to create that BLG file locally and on a schedule, and then you can use uh, PAL performance analysis of logs to to analyze it. Again, that's another analysis tool. Um, your data migration assistant DMA will will capture an aggregate of the counters. We'll take a look at an example of that at the end. Um, your perf insights will grab the the BLG file as well and do some analysis on that. Um, that's in the source output. And of course, like I said before, I don't really care how you get it as long as it's relatively uh, silent and and uh, not intensive to the to the machine that is being tested. Um, don't forget about SQL insights. Um, and I think you you have a session on SQL insights that y'all recorded recorded in the past. Um, that's something that you could be that could be leveraged to for post migration scenarios. And um, I mentioned query store here. I, I mentioned it. I would I would say that it's really good at supporting information to capture for any uh, uh, query performance over time, and and think of uh, capturing your plan health, and it follows the database no matter where you move it. So you you set it up on prem. It's this is essentially what it's designed for. You enable it on prem. And then when you do your migration, you can continue monitoring and see if there's been any changes to your plan health um, post-migration. <laughs> okay. So really lightly, I mean, tune first or migrate um, or migrate now. This is a classic trade-off, and it really is going to come down to skill, risk, control, time, and money. Do you have the skills to complete the work? 
we need to bring someone in? Um, what's the risk of making changes while the application's in flight? How much control over the application do you have to make changes? If it's a vendor app, you may not have as much control as, as you would like, um, something to keep in mind. So you always wanna work with your vendor. Do you have time to complete the work? We always recommend um, pre-post migration maintenance, but what we're talking about is the time it may take to investigate a performance in, uh, issue, deal with change controls, dev tests, and things like that. And then, you know, then money, you know, it, it, it costs money to tune and time is money. So you may have the skills, but the DBA's time is often monetized to some degree. And there's certainly cost on the consulting work if you need to bring in a resource. So you may identify that it's cheaper in terms of Azure hybrid benefits and reservations just to use the solution as it fits in your target platform. <clears throat> so these are just some considerations to, to have to, to think about. Do you tune first or do you migrate? Do you, you, migrate know my, you know my feeling on that with the dirty garage slide, right? <laughs> Oh don't wow! Move, don't What's move that? your junk. Don't take your junk with you when you move. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> don't move your Clean junk up first. Yeah. Clean up first. Yeah, if you can, uh, if you can, that's the preferred. Uh, that's the preferred method because you would be surprised tuning five or six queries. Maybe you can go a whole smaller size on your VM. Maybe you can reduce your IOPS and, and and reduce your costs, you know, by a huge amount just by tuning like your top ten queries, for example. So it's worth spending a week or so saying, can I just add a couple indexes, and now suddenly I can get a much smaller VM. So it's worth looking into uh, at least a little bit. Yeah, I would just uh, echo that. I always remember a few years ago I attended one of Joe Sack's presentations at Pass Summit. And he said, there's a lot of you, so people watching the show, that can save a lot of people a lot of money in Azure. So um, <laughs> I just always remember that when I think about how important right. tuning is. Absolutely. I love, I love that analogy because, you know, I've seen people move and that's the first time that they've ever cleaned their garage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so we're going to talk about Perfmon and Perf Insights. Now, a lot of folks will start Perfmon this way, right? They'll just go into Perfmon, and you know the first counter you get is your percentage of processor time, right? And then you go through the activity of right-clicking and searching through our counters. And I mean, even even Pam and I, we've done this a thousand times. We still go, we're still hunting and pecking for counters, right? So if someone says, "Hey, there's something going on," if you're from a troubleshooting perspective or from a monitoring perspective. So a lot of what y'all are gonna be doing is baselining and monitoring. Hey, how does this look right now, right? I don't wanna be hunting for counters. So what I'm gonna tell you to do is instead of doing it this way, open up a command prompt. And some of you may know about this already, but launch perfmon with slash sys, S-Y-S. And when you do that, you notice that all of a sudden I got, I got a different view. I got this in this report view, and I already have counters populated. Well, why is that? Per, Perfmon slash sys will give you the last view that you had open, but more importantly, it will allow you to save. Set, you can click save settings as, and then save a template, okay? So what I've done is I actually have several templates here of the counters I care about for CPU, IO and storage, memory, SQL statistics, tempdb, and my weights. And I have them set up to where I'm on the view that I really care about. So for weight statistics, I really kind of like, I like this view, or I like the um, line chart view, right? Um, for IO and storage, I would really prefer, actually, I'd prefer this view, report view, right? Um, CPU, I may, I may have a different view. But it allows you to quickly, and, and I'm, I'm populating the stuff already. You see, I have, I have all this workloads running down here, making my box crazy. So that's that's what I'm going to tell you to do that, to try to make this a, a lot easier for y'all to to deal with from a like a quick at a glance kind of view. Now, this is not going to save your BLG files, but it gives you this nice template approach to where as, as you're looking at workloads, you may run the workload for five minutes, you may run it, you know, you may have like these, these smaller tests that you're doing. 
this will help you help you along your sizing activities, looking at the counters that we're looking at. There's other switches as well, like you know, slash REL for the reliability monitor, slash RES to look at your resources. But slash sys is what will allow you to save the local template file. Okay. So let's take a look at the other scenario that I wanted you to look at is, actually, I may have it already open. I do. OK. This is the Perf Insights output. And Anna, I think we have the, the um, documentation on Perf Insights. This is really easy to run. You're going to run this through a, a, a command console. And the first thing that you're going to see when you open this up is your key findings. Like from a performance perspective, like what's going on, what's your health, low, medium, and high scenarios here. You know, there's two scenarios that are high, two medium for CPU, one low for Windows. I, I'm not going to focus so much on this. I will show you where it's at. Like if you click SQL, you can see there's some some key findings, like databases are located on the physical disk, contains a mixture of data and log files. Our SQL Server instances are configured to use unlimited maximum SQL Server memory. We don't recommend that. Um, but what I'm going to focus on, and this is be, because I, I'm looking at this from a from a storage perspective. I told you earlier that we would we would hone in on this. So I click storage, and I look at my high re, um, resolution disk usage. You can see here that I've it, it breaks this down into I/O throughput and latency, and I have my disks that are. Are, are set up for the uh, on this line chart, so I can just remove all the Q depth stuff. We don't need to see that in the chart; it makes it a little busier. And I can see where my workload <clears throat> my workload was just going just above this this line here. That orange line would be my P twenty disk. So if I choose a P thirty for my workload here, I am perfectly within that range. This is a really good way, Perf Insights is a really good way of kind of seeing how your virtual machine is going to fit into these work, in, into your disk configuration. You can also do the same thing for throughput. So I'm going to remove all the Q depth stuff again, just because I want to focus on the throughput on the, on the graph. And I do have a spike, OK? So I'm not going to tell you to tune for spikes. We can handle the spike, try right. to troubleshoot and figure out what's going on with that. But again, you can see that I'm within this range here. Otherwise, there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of spike here that's going on. But I can see that, and you can see the throughput, 200 megabytes per second, right here. That goes along with what my P30. If you rem remember from our previous sessions that Pam and I did, and for Got those it. that. For those um, that are really just, honed in on latency, really quick, you, th this is your latency chart at the bottom. And we told, said not to focus on this as much, but if you need it, hey, if you need it, you need it. And 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 then this is where to analyze. So, so go ahead, Anna, sorry. No, I was just going to make sure I was reading this right. So all the horizontal lines, these are the different thresholds that you get with a certain storage right. level. And then what... I see there's like blue, there's purple, there's some different different workloads being monitored down at the bottom. What are those just different workloads or how do I think about those? Yeah, these are the different performance workloads that are that are popping up here, um, different processes that are popping up. And then the what you're seeing in the horizontal lines is the is the fixed scenarios for these particular disks. The, okay, so those are, are those are separate disks on your host machine though, right? Right. E each right. one of those so, is a separate disk. Yeah. Oh, right. I see. I see. Right. And I have workloads targeted hitting these separate disks. Got it. OK. And then the so what you were saying earlier is like under the P30 horizontal line, what we're seeing is like that's right. where most of my workloads are within that range. So I can take this and say P30 would be fine. Mm -hmm. Right. Got it. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I mean, I'm using <laughs> disk speed, disk speed to hit these separate physical disk. Cool. Okay. This is a useful tool. Absolutely. And and um, on top of that, now you can, from a configuration perspective, and I'm just kind of like cherry picking some specific scenarios, like storage pool, you would have to go through and run, 
potentially some PowerShell, go through the GUI. I, I really like that this brings everything together. So from a storage pool perspective, I can see what my configuration is for this particular E-Series machine. So um, I'm zoomed in a little, bit, <laughs> a little bit here, but you can see that the interleave is 64K. You can see the disks that are a part of this particular storage pool. The, um, and the size, you know, when you zoom out, the, the columns won't be mushed together like this. Mm. Um, you can see from a volume map perspective, what is what is temp, what is OS, what is a data disk, and what pools that they're tied to, and the number of disks within the pool and the disks that are attached. So down here, this is my, my transaction log. This is my data files. You can see the number of disks that are involved in this. So there's eight, dry, eight disks for my uh, data files. There's two for my transaction log. And then here's how the disk map is tied. This is my the physical disk to the logical disk. Um, is it a managed disk or not? And it and is, this is probably the most important. Pam, this is really good, right? Yeah, with the caching my, on. My host mm -hmm. caching, right? Yeah, yeah. That's so, great. So I would have to, without this, I'm not saying that there aren't other methods of doing this, but I really like Perf Insights for this, for this reason, not just to get a health, overall health check, but to also get an idea. I mean, my findings wise, I'm perfectly healthy, <clears throat> but it's really nice to know what my, my disk resolution um, mapping to disks are and then what my storage pool, my, how my volume is mapped and how my disks are mapped to those volumes. So David, if you were seeing any sort of disk level or VM level throttling, would that show up here in the findings? You would see, you would see that pop up in the findings, yeah, okay. and you would you okay. would also you would also it would stick out like a sore thumb on your high disk resolution report because it would be just like pegged at the P thirty line or something like right yeah okay got it and Absolutely. one final question I have on this is is this something that because like I see the Azure icon up there like is this only for things already in a VM or can I use this before I migrate I actually ran um. If we had time, I would show you my. I ran this on prem. You can get, oh. you can run this on prem. I actually ran this on a VM as well. So, so you can you now obviously if you're if I'm just running this on prem and you don't have anything in a storage pool, this is just going to be completely empty. Right. Um. But 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 you can also run this on prem to get an idea. And the most important thing on prem is that to me on prem this this tab becomes really really important. Oh yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah, this is super handy. Um, definitely something that I would I would hone <laughs> in on. So um, I'm going to go through this next piece pretty quickly. Azure Monitor is really big, um, but I, what I want to do is spend some time about mapping kind of our our data elements to a table, touching on the metrics, showing you the um, the storage configuration, and then we'll kind of wrap up some other topics. So here is that EDS v4 that Pam and I absolutely love. So um, I'm going to map so map like what you would see in the documentation um, to some key scenarios. So when you're looking at sizing and leveraging our documentation, you're going to want to match, like I said, the source performance metrics to the documented resource capabilities for your VM and disks. So um, you're going to match your on-prem IOPS and throughput to your max uncached disk performance. You do this by matching the IOPS and throughput metrics to the maximum uncached disk IOP and throughput per second. These are the primary resources that we want to size against. IOP and throughput to the uncached disk performance. Okay. Your next scenario is to map is to map uh, data file reads plus tempdb reads and writes to the cache limits. And you're going to do this by matching the data file reads and tempdb reads to the maximum cached and tempdb storage throughput. This is only available when, when read caching is enabled. And essentially, it gives us a 30% buffer of additional performance, helping us reduce what's counted against the uncached throughput. And that's going to help us, again, weather the storm, as we talked about before. Um, we're going to tell you to monitor your percentage of processor time. Um, in the documentation, you're going to see the number of processors available per machine and the potential constrained cores that can help with, from a SQL licensing perspective. We actually covered that concept in the sizing video. Um, 
It's recommended to size based on IOP and throughput and not let CPU licensing drive your testing and drive the discussion. Monitor available memory for resource usage efficiency. It's important to uh, make sure that SQL Server has the memory it needs to perform well. And you can match the memory needs of an on-prem environment using available megabytes and looking at SQL Server memory health uh, target and total. Um, SQL, SQL Server memory target and total, basically how much is SQL Server will it, willing, or how much does it want to consume and how much can it consume? And that's the gap that you wanna monitor in the counters. Um, also check the error log to see if a lot, of, a lot of memory has been paged out for any reason. And you can use Management Studio for like memory health over time to get a look at your ideal memory needs and uh, overall stability. Um, ensure the uh, number of disks does not exceed the minimum state for your VM size. It's kind of a watermark of how you can scale against the VM table. Monitor your network bandwidth. I mean, we know that drops and disconnects are bad, right? That, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you need to be a network expert, but we know that that's not good. <clears throat> so if you see that, you know, connect, work with your server network team. And of course, ensure that TempDB can fit on the ephemeral disk. And that's really a capacity discussion. Now, now that we've kind of understood this, and you know, again, this 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 series builds upon itself. We're looking at looking at your <laughs> I hear a phone. <laughs> uh, looking at your uh, your your metrics and monitoring. Um, you can think of your Azure monitor metrics a lot like PerfMon. OK, these are like perfmon, perfmon metrics. Um, their metrics are numerical values that describe some aspect of the system at a particular point in time. And your logs are going to contain different types of data organized into re uh, record sets. So telemetry, such as events and traces, are stored as logs in addition to performance data, and it can be combined for analysis. What we're focusing on is the Azure Monitor metrics component. <laughs> that drives that piece of Azure Monitor, okay? Now, in particular, and, and so now, so like think about everything that we've talked about, we've moved our workload to a virtual machine in the cloud, and now we're testing that cached scenario for both VM IOPS and throughput and disk IOPS and throughput. So this is your virtual machine level performance metrics for IOPS cached IOPS and bandwidth and uncached IOPS and bandwidth, okay? VM level. And we also have <coughs> our disk IOPS and bandwidth um, for data disk as well as OS disk IOPS and bandwidth. Now, for either of these scenarios, for your VM level or your disk level, if you get reach 100%, you're, you're at or near 100%, that's basically your capping level. So if you hit 100%, you're capped. Right. So so this go you know th this you know we covered this in the storage in the storage uh, uh, deep dive. But this is what the core concept is. And so what I'm going to show you really quick is what that looks like from a from a performance perspective. Okay. So I've been running this workload. And what I want to hone in on is we have this scenario where my un my VM uncached bandwidth is right at a hundred percent. My this has been this is my VM cached bandwidth consumed percentage right here. This was at a hundred percent previously. So in this case, my uncached bandwidth is completely completely capped. And it continues to be. My cache bandwidth is not so much. Now, if you look at my disk level, my data disk bandwidth <clears throat> uh, consume percentage and my IOP consume percentage, this is never, I mean, I've got a spike, I think, up to 65%. <clears throat> but otherwise, on the disk level, I'm not really coming close to being consumed. Where I'm really, my consumption. My consumption is at the VM level. 
And so this is a scenario where you're either going to tune or resize the VM. So if that's that's the scenario that you're looking at. If I had this at the disk level, <coughs> if I had this at the disk level, that would be that would be a little more difficult to to address. So I would either need to tune that tune that um, scenario, look at my caching scenario. Ho hopefully, it's something small change that I can make. If if not, then I'm basically going to have to do something more of an overhaul from an architectural perspective on my storage to address that. Because storage is, is, is definitely going to be more intensive to address than re just simply resizing a VM. Any, any thoughts, anything to add to that, Pam? Um, any questions on that, Anna? Yeah, the, I mean, one thing I just wanted to comment on the throttling is, is you mentioned this in a couple of past presentations as well, David, that just because you're being, I'm sorry, capped, not throttled, just because your <laughs> IO is being capped periodically doesn't necessarily mean that you have a performance problem. So, it, right. so if you if you once in a while see these metrics hit the 100% and stay there for a few seconds and then come back down, you're probably okay. You probably don't need to resize. I mean, you know, the system, uh, depending on how sensitive you are to this, the system can usually handle, you know, a few spikes like that. But something like David is showing here where you're pegged at 100%, that's right. probably more of an indication that you need to upsize. And then in this case, it's the uncached bandwidth that's that's capped, which means you need to go to something that has higher remote throughput. The VM needs higher remote throughput. Um, so that's so so that's kind of what you look at. I mean one thing you want to make sure is that all of your drives that can have read caching have read caching turned on because you see you've got plenty of cached bandwidth left there. Like you're you're not even getting anywhere near your cached bandwidth limits there. Yeah. So so yeah, maybe you would bandwidth check is fine. Right, so maybe you would check and make sure that all of your data drives that are hosting data files have read caching right. turned on, right? That'd be one thing you would check. Yeah. Another thing you would check is make sure your TempDB is on the ephemeral drive and that it's not using those remote IOPS because the ephemeral drive goes against the cached limit, not the uncached limit. So there's a few mm -hmm. configuration things you might look at first if you're seeing this capping and make sure you've followed all those best practices. We have all of that listed out in our documentation under the best practices checklist there. So you would just make sure that you're following everything in that checklist. And if right. not, you might be able to address this capping without even changing the VM. Um, right. So check that first. And then if not, then yeah, up, upsizing the VM is probably where you're at. Yeah, that's a really good point, Pam, because if you're, and I think this is the example we gave in the in the uh, storage discussion, but if the application is requesting 10,000 IOPS, but it's only getting back 1,500, that's such a ridiculous difference that you know that the, the application user is gonna notice that and they're gonna be suffering from that. Right. But right. I think the example, I think for like a DS, uh, D8S V3 is 12,800. So let's say that the application is asking again for 10,000 IOPS and, and it can't, it, it can, own, um, or, or let's say 15,000 IOPS and the D8S V3 is 12,800. So that difference is not that, it's not that much. Is the application user mm -hmm. even seeing it? Yeah. So if they're not if they're not seeing that just because you're being being capped, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a massive issue that you have to rush and resize something or re-architect mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good point um, because what your metrics are going to show you is does capping exist? Yes or no? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And then so I think you're you're set up to kind of use all the things that you've been learning to check. So that's why right. I think this is right. so important because not only right. just monitoring, but you have to understand like some of the nuances that you all talk about, like, oh, because yeah. this is happening, you should check this um, instead of just, you know, scaling up or si resizing and right. either not addressing the problem or making a more expensive solution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and most of the monitoring in VM, like you can, if you're already doing things on-prem, you can probably do the same kinds of things running in VM. That's a great thing about running SQL in a VM. It's the same thing. So if you were already using like management studio has built in reports, like performance dashboard reports, if you were already using that, keep using it. Like the, the, that stuff is all the 
same. If you were using Perfmon before, keep using it. You still have Perfmon in, in your Azure VM. So whatever you were doing for monitoring before, you can still use that. But now you have these additional tools on top of that with mm -hmm. the Azure metrics and the Perf insights that will kind of help give you some more Azure perspective. Because the thing that's different in Azure is that the infrastructure is different. SQL Server is the same. Everything inside the VM is the same as what you're doing on-prem, but the infrastructure is different and how you address those issues are different. So maybe you bump up the size of the VM. Maybe you add more disks to your storage pool. You know, those are the ways that you address it, but the ways you find the problems are, are very similar to what you're already doing on-prem. Yeah, you may have a couple of things that are different, like, like SQL Insights specifically, specifically for an Azure virtual machine, or, or you may have like Azure Metrics, for example. But the core methodology does not change from what you're doing on-prem to the cloud is, is yep. what I hear you're saying. And, yes. and, I, and I would also, this is why I stress like, yeah, um, this is what you're doing for your source monitoring and, and sh uh, shaping and sizing activities. But those same methods are, should be carried along with you as you've done your migration. One, to make sure, am I fitting the way I think I would be fitting in the cloud? And do I need to continue to to look at resizing based upon a workload? Because mm -hmm. some of the some of the um, assumptions and conclusions that you've made previously, there may be in a variable that was missed, or variables as we all know change. And if something changes, I need to be able to respond to that change. So mm -hmm. again, like what we we're looking at is that these VM level metrics, um, and I'll just kind of put this here uh, fairly quick, and then move on and to. By the way, the, the reason where we're where we're spending all this time on IO and throughput and we're not talking about very many other metrics is because this is where customers get tripped up in VM. I mean, that's why this whole series is kind of focused around IO and throughput because more than 50% of our performance cases are due to IO throughput issues in VM. So that's why this, yep. this is what we're harping on. Um, so it's not that monitoring CPU and memory is not important. It's just those are a lot easier than, than storage. <laughs> So very, very quickly, I'm going to show the uh, the sizing tool that it's a console app that's part of uh, data, Database Migration Assistant 4.5. Um, and essentially what the this is what the methodology that's used for the the console app in the data migration assistant. It's you'll see it in the SQL assessments folder and then you can run run that console app. So it grabs an aggregate of performance every 30 seconds for as long as the workload is running. It takes all of those candidate scenarios that matches, I mean, think about the sizing tree that I walked through, think about the, the memory consumption, CPU, all those kind of scenarios. It meets those resource situations and the capabilities and then ranks it based on price and will give you that price ranking for SQL DB Manage instance or SQL VM, and let's take a look at that really quick. So, if I and I'm just going to bring this over. This is, um, and I'm, I'll zoom in on this to, to for clarity. So if it, so if if I were if I were to run this and then I've already run the the performance um, capture. If I were to run this really quick, you could see here that it's recommending that I go to a E8 uh, AS B4, um, P30 caching is read only. For my log, caching is none. Use the SSD, the local ephemeral disk. <clears throat> and it's breaking down the recommendation reasons fully for what I would be doing on this particular machine. Now, if I were to run this uh, separately, I can use the same performance capture and also run this for manage instance or SQL DB. Um, it's it's not necessary for you to do anything special. Uh, oh. So you this is managed instance business critical for managed instance. So yeah, so it's just something really quick to look at that will also help you with sizing. And again, remember our best practices to get the per, uh, perfmon source metrics. Choose the right disk. Isolate your files. Enable host caching. Make sure you're doing your I/O best practices like data compression, column store indexing. Any, you're, it's still SQL Server after all. Target your ephemeral disk on the D drive. Use a storage configuration wizard. That will address, in, in your Azure Marketplace images, 80 to 90% of the key things that we recommend. And of course, continue monitoring with Azure Monitor. Monitor, monitor, monitor. We said always be tuning before. Now we're saying always be monitoring. 
and <laughs> take a look at our references. The, we've we've uh, um, all the documentation has been has been overhauled, and uh, we continue to work on that to make sure that we're giving you the best advice. Awesome. This has been a jam packed show and we've learned so much. Um, I want to thank you, uh, David and Pam so much for coming on the show, uh, to our viewers, all those references that David just showed are in the description of, for the video on our YouTube channel. So we encourage you to go ahead over to our YouTube channel and subscribe, check out the links, like this video. Um, and, and really with that, you know, we hope to see you next time on data exposed. Thank you.